Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them so you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that will work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable coaching to learn more. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Larry Levine. He's the author and co-host of the Selling from the well, author of the book Selling from the Heart, co-host of the Selling from the Heart podcast. Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great seeing you. I've been looking forward to this, Colin Stewart. We're going to have a great time. I'm looking forward to this too. Uh, I like the book. I love the idea of what we're going to talk about today and how we're going to build and we're going to dig into how somebody can establish trust with their prospects, with their customers, um, with their accounts. So before we jump in, what let's talk about what is trust and, and how it relates to the sales process. Well, I think it's uh, trust is everything because we do know this. When trust is really high, things move along really quick. And I think you'd agree, Colin, when trust is really low, it seems like things come to a screeching halt. And and I'll take it one step farther, even in sales, and I'm a sales geek at heart, is when there is no trust, it seems like the whole thing that the conversation revolves around is price and products. When trust is really high and value has been established, or or should I say meaningful value, Mm. it seems like the conversations take on a whole new life. And so where where I I really believe the missing link, regardless of what sales channel y'all operate in, is trust. When we can establish trust, in fact, the faster we can establish trust, Watch what starts to happen next. And I remember, uh, if I can share a quick story with you, I, I remember on the Selling from the Heart podcast, we had a gentleman who's a college professor at the Kellogg School of Business in Chicagoland area. And he's done TED Talks on trust and so forth. And he he shared something on our podcast, which I thought was really interesting. He says, when you meet somebody, and this applies directly into sales, he goes, when you meet somebody for the first time, you engage in an opportunity for the first time. You have to be able to establish trust within the first three minutes of that conversation. Doesn't mean that game over. It just means that if you're not establishing it, you're constantly trying to establish it through the whole entire journey. And I thought that was interesting. Same applies to why I believe trust is so mission critical and why salespeople need to think about how do I build trust and how do I build credibility really fast? I can always tell a rep of mine is doing a good job or a bad job by the number of customer references they get asked. If the rep does a great job, the most customers aren't asking to talk to references. If the rep has done an okay or a poor job, then they're, we're getting, got to talk to three references we're fighting on price. Like the the difference is very clear, very obvious, very quickly. Now you bring up a great point. So so let's just think about that. Why don't you think salespeople? And I'd just be curious. I got my thought on this. Mm-hmm. But you just brought up the reference word. Why do you believe that salespeople struggle to get references from their clients to use somewhere during the sales process? Because you know it's going to come up at some point in time. It's going to come up. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the core of, of sales, and I think a, lo- a lot of people miss this, the core of sales is setting, is making sure that there's a really strong fit in the first place and then setting good expectations and setting really solid expectations with, if I'm a, if I'm an AE, if I'm a first time AE and I'm selling to a VP of sales and I've been in this role, I was selling to like heads of mines that were procuring equipment. And for me to try and set strong expectations with somebody who is 20 years my senior and was the head of this huge mine it was a really hard kind of ego thing to think, oh, I can, you know, I have the capacity to do this, but it's, it's what's required of somebody in your role. 
we're not just here to be meek and try and get the sale and win it on price and be the it be the easiest sale and veer away from the hard things. It's about having the hard conversations up front to set really strong expectations for this is what the engagement's going to look like. I see that you know first make sure you're a fit, then make sure that you set really strong um, expectations. And I think that's the I think a lot of reps uh, that I've seen they do a really great job of understanding. Okay, this is what I'm gonna. This is what you need. And then they kind of, all right, let's move to selling mode, right? And it's not about setting the expectations. And it's when those expectations aren't set that you, that you, you know, manufacture disappointment in your customers regularly. And that makes it really hard to get references. So that's my two cents off the cuff. No, and, and I like, you just said something that I think is really important. And it all goes back to establishing trust and why I believe it's so important. You said having the difficult conversation is so the hard conversations. Those are the necessary conversations you must have up front. I'll call these healthy business conversations, or we can call these healthy, assertive conversations. It's okay. So this goes back to, it's hard to establish trust. I don't care. Insert title of whatever you want to use in sales, right? Is it's hard to have these type of conversations if you lack confidence, you lack believability in yourself, you lack believability in your messaging and you have low self-worth. It's hard to have these type of conversations up front, but mark my word on this and you hit home on this is if you can do this and you do this up front, watch how fast you build trust. You've set the stage like none other in sales. So if we flip this around, I think most people, and I'll just throw this out there so we can laugh about it. But I think most people, unfortunately, in that first conversation and go to product, company, solutions, things like that. So you act just like almost everybody else. But if you can put your mindset, if you can put yourself in their shoes, these are executives, leaders, key decision makers. If we know we're lacking trust and we're lacking credibility, have these good, healthy business conversations up front, then, then watch how fast you establish credibility and build trust. They will start sharing things with you. They're not sharing with other people. Totally. I mean, it's so easy to fall into the habit of, you know, plenty of will come, will show up to a call and be like, okay, tell me what you do. What's different from you and your competitor. And I've caught myself before and I, I, I've been guilty of it, you know, recently, um, not as recently, I'm better at catching myself now, but man, you talked to me five years ago and you asked me that question. I was going to rant and ramble, maybe not five, maybe like seven or eight years ago. I was going to rant and ramble for 45 minutes. It'd be the column podcast and the guest wouldn't speak at all. Sure. And, yet if, and thankfully chorus and gong, you weren't, weren't a thing back when I was uh, selling because, <laughs> oh man, my <laughs> ratios would have been awful. <laughs> Because I know so much about the product and I know so much about what we do and how we help companies that I could just like, they asked me the question. So I'm just going to do my best job of presenting. But to realize that that's not what the sales conversation is about. That's not what the prospect wants to hear. It's they want to talk, they want to share, and they want to feel heard. And I think this is what, uh, you know, this is kind of at least what I've seen, you know, be that starting point of building trust is just, you know, you're, you're not going to walk into a car dealership and the, seven reps are going to run up to you and be like, Hey, can I sell you a car? You know, it's the person who like really knows the very specifics in about the, you know, this car. Oh no, no, you don't want this. You want to stay away from that because of this. And they're going to be genuine and honest with you. It goes back. It, it's simple things, Colin, but yet the simple things are the hardest things to do. It's, mm -hmm. do you see me? Do you know me? How are you going to make me feel? And they may, they may not say this up front, but a smart seller, a smart, astute seller, whether you're face to face, whether you're on a virtual platform, insert name or whatever virtual platform you all are using, or whether you're on the phone, this all plays out. Do you see me? Do you hear me? How are you going to make me feel? And this is happening rapid fire. And you got to be astute to this as a, and smart sellers are astute to this. So I always say this. And this plays down the trust lane, the more comfortable you can make somebody feel about you, the more comfortable they will become. The more comfortable they become about you, they soon start sharing what I call business secrets. And these business secrets, they're holding close to their heart. They're not telling all the other sellers. 
because it goes back to, are you making them feel comfortable? Can you see me? Can you hear me? How are you making me feel? You can nail those. Watch how fast they start sharing secrets. Yeah. And I mean, so much of that is a pattern interrupt because I, you know, as salespeople, we can kind of get grouped into, uh, especially as a B2B seller, you get grouped into the salesperson category with a lot of different other sellers, uh, rightly or wrongly. And, you know, I think even my immediate reaction to walking in a Best Buy and somebody runs up to me and is like, hey, can I help you with something? Even if I don't know where the thing is, my automatic reaction is like, no, I'm good. Of course. I'm guilty of it as well. Yeah. I, I My job in high school, I sold hockey gear and ski gear. And like, I would do the same thing. And everybody, everybody would say no. But if I walk, if I let them come in the store and be like, hey, it looks like you're looking for a hockey stick or it look, looks like you're looking for a set of skis. What kind of skiing are you doing? You know, like that's a much easier conversation than like, hey, I'm coming at you. But I think yeah. that's what everybody's used to, you yeah. know, is the like, I'm going to come at you. Let me show you. These are all the sales. Let me try and get you through the door. This is the promotion now, now, now. Yeah. You know, it contributes to this kind of, I don't know, low trust environment. I, I'm curious, like, what else do you think has kind of brought us to this point where buyers don't trust salespeople as much as they used to? It, it go it, here, here's another, it, it goes back. How about this one? Well, a couple things is I believe this. I don't know if you believe it, but I really believe perceptions, reality, Colin, and perceptions through the eyes of the beholder. So where I'm going with this is it, it goes to perception is reality and it goes to track record. And I think this is why trust is where it's at buyers insert titles of whoever y'all are dealing with they have their own perception of all the salespeople they've dealt with in the past and that's what y'all have to overcome and that goes right along with track record and unfortunately perception and track record for a vast majority of salespeople may not be at its highest point which just means there's opportunity for those sales professionals that are out there to rise to the top and in selling from the heart, I, I I poke the bear on this. There's a massive difference between a sales rep and a sales professional. There's a lot of sales reps out there. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of sales professionals are out there. So one of the questions, you know, one of the questions I always ask is what's the perception of salespeople? Right? If if we just look at this through a common sense lens. The perception of salespeople is not very good. So then we just flip this around and then it's you as a seller, how do you want to be perceived? You control the narrative on this. So if you want to, if you want to start building trust, overcome the perception barrier and then overcome the track record barrier. And you got to think about this through the lens of the buyer and all the other decision makers, think about the track record and the perception issues they've had over the years with all the salespeople they've come across. That's what you have to overcome. That's my two cents. Totally. No, I'd love to, I want to get into how you think about building trust. I, but before I just, I nodded when you said it, but maybe for those of us that are listening that haven't, you know, spent as much time thinking about the subject. Talk to me about the difference between a sales rep and a sales professional. Um, can I give you my smart aleck response first? Will you allow me to do that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's my smart aleck response. <laughs> no, but tell me, but tell me, cheek on this one though. And yeah, yeah, I'll get. But I always say this: sales professionals do the things that sales reps find excuses for. And it, and it gets down to practice. It gets down to preparation. It gets down to uh, discipline. It gets down to consistency, working on your craft, working on yourself, uh, doing things even when you don't feel like you want to do them. Professional athletes are held to certain degrees of accountability. Professional athletes work really, really hard. They have coaches. They have mentors. There's so many sales and there's so many sports analogies that have crossed over into sales. And I remember when I was writing Selling from the Heart, I saw it. I was in a social news feed one day and it, and it said, what sport closely relates to sales? 
And so then I chimed in. I said, I really don't think there's a sport that closely aligns to sales because until salespeople can plan, practice, and prepare like professional athletes, it's hard to compare. So if we bring this into the sales world, is sales professionals out plan, they out prepare, and they out practice sales reps. Sales reps, in my opinion, do just enough to get by. And sales professionals continually work on their craft to become even better and better and better. How's that, Colin? That's great. I love both versions. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I nodded. I understood all that when you said it, but I was like, yeah, we're going to get, get, get you explained for everybody else, not me. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. I, I want to talk about one of the one of the big pieces that you know you and I have talked about in the past about those what makes a professional is building trust. And so help me understand your how you think about, you know, if you're coaching a rep or, you know, how do you think about building trust just in, in general? What are the kind of big big pillars here? Um there there's four there's four big pillars here at selling from the heart. You know, we believe there's four big pillars in building trust. And I'll give you the pillars and then I'm sure time allowed we'll break all of these down. The four pillars of building trust is we take the foundation of selling from the heart. And the foundation of selling from the heart is how your authentic self sells you. So if you want to build trust, it starts with yourself first. And I'm a massive believer in this. And just follow along with me, everybody. This will make sense. Is the inner work that you all do will yield you monumental levels of outer success. If you go inward, watch how fast you start having success outward. This plays in how you establish trust. And so where I'm going with this is how your authentic self sells you, that becomes the key foundation of all of this. The four pillars are simple. It's building authentic relationships, bringing meaningful value, wrapping this with an inspirational experience and being extremely disciplined with this. So if we look at building these four pillars, this plays out in sales, regardless of what sales channels you all play into or sell into, this all factors into this. It's hard to build trust if you don't know anybody. And so the first, the first part of this is who do you know? So sellers out there, look at your, look at your, target account list, look at your customer list. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to think about is when you're establishing trust is who do you know in these places? Who do you know? What do you know about these people, both personally and professionally? And if I can peel this back even more, it, I the first word that comes to mind in this call on is congruency. If you want to build trust, y'all got to be congruent. The walk's got to match the talk. Tell me more about that. Um, in a world where they don't trust salespeople or vast majority do not trust salespeople, it's, and everyone talks about it. I think one of the biggest buzzwords, in fact, authenticity was Merriam Webster's word of the year in 2023, believe it or not. So it's finally getting its rightful, you know, accolades out there. But I think a lot of people talk about trust and a lot of people talk about authenticity because it just comes out. Trust requires practice. Trust requires intentionality. Authenticity requires practice and intentionality. So it's about being congruent. And people can smell this. There's rampant skepticism out there. People's BS meters are at an all-time high. They can, whether you want to believe me or not, whether people believe me or not, is people sniff this out. It comes across in your eye movement and your tonality and your posture, eyebrow raises, how you're using your hands, if you're leaning in or leaning back. People sense all of this stuff. So the walk has to match the talk. If all you do is talk and you don't take action on it, it's just meaningless words. Mm -hmm. So the first part of this, if you want to establish trust, is you got to start building genuine, authentic, congruent relationships. And what's really interesting is 
if I ask a vast majority of salespeople and sales leaders, does trust matter and does relationships matter? They're all going to say yes. And what are you doing to practice all of this? It just doesn't come natural. And I think we just assume that because we're humans, we understand how to do all this. I'm here to say it requires practice. And that's why the first leg of building trust is we got to bring our authentic self to the forefront and we got to understand and unpack how to build genuine, authentic relationships, not just with a few key people, but we got to build these high, wide, and deep inside of organizations. The more you know, the more you grow. Totally. And me, that's the first leg in building trust is building authentic relationships. No, I, I want to ask more about authentic relationships because um, I, I was thinking back to the example of me selling into the, I can't remember if it was the mining something supervisor or that I was, I've got a particular guy in mind, his name is Doug. And I just okay. would be terrified being on the call. And if I think back to like, we obviously don't have the course recording to that call, but if I think back, I was nervous as hell. I didn't understand. I didn't deeply understand what a you know supervisor of you know whatever he was doing at a at a big mine. I didn't fully understand or could appreciate what he was going through. I just knew I had the, these particular generators to sell or rent, and I wasn't even that confident because this is one of the first deals I had taken solo at this company. And so I must have been a just big ball of lack of confidence on this call. That's probably not going to do a great job of establishing that trust because I don't think I even trusted myself with the recommendations I was making. Hundred percent. So you just you just bring up something that that's really key, and it goes back to what I said before: when you lack confidence, you lack believability, you lack believability in your messaging, and you have so low self worth. It oozes out of your pores. It oozes out of your vocabulary. People sense that. If insert whatever titles y'all are calling into. There's no excuse today with all the technology that's out there that you can't spend a little bit of time to understand that person's position out there. Now, when, now like when I started, I started in sales pre-internet. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have all, we didn't have all of this stuff. So now I just dated myself, everybody. So we didn't have all of this. If I wanted to find out about all this, I had to either sit down and ask somebody or check this out. I had to go to the library to figure all this stuff out. Yeah. But now we have now we have this at our fingertips. If I wanted to insert title of whoever I was calling into, I can just go into Google or whatever search engine and say, if Colin's the CTO of a company, I can say, what are CTO challenges and issues that CTOs in X space are having in 2024? And it's going to spit out whatever it's ever going to. And then I can just start learning about it. So I can at least start having some logical conversations with people right up front. This goes back to you understand me. Do you understand some of my issues, my challenges? 100%. The ability to have ChatGPT say, "Hey, what does a CTO do? You know, what are their top priorities going to be? You know, what are some of the jobs to be done they might struggle with? What are some of the obstacles?" And just to have that conversation with that resource is incredibly helpful. The ChatGPT, hundred percent. It goes back to practice, right? Mm -hmm. It just goes back to right. And you go, man, I'm not, I'm not getting enough at bats. That's okay, but you can get enough at bats by just practicing with your peers or practicing with your leader or practicing with uh, a friend or practicing with a customer that you already have. There's no excuse why you can't practice some of these conversations. So it, when you do get engaged it more, it becomes fluent. And I like that it starts with uh, the authentic relationship starts with, you know, almost the relationship with yourself of like, Hey, I understand, you know, what I'm doing, that my role in the system, and then I can uh, reach out and say, okay, now I'm going to work on understanding of my prospect, my customer's role in the system. And it's a genuine appreciation and empath empathy for, you know, both yourself and this other individual. 100%. 100%. So then once we start establishing authentic relationships, and this is the who you know, and it's just really simple. Here's what I would challenge everybody is whether these are 
people you're calling into right now, they're in your funnel somewhere, they're even your current customers or clients, however you want to refer to them. Just a simple thing. I'm a simple guy. I don't overcomplicate much. I just do simple things with consistency and discipline. Here's my challenge. It's really simple. It's the rule of three. Just find three things, right? Three things you can get to know about somebody personally and professionally. You know, I'll date myself again. And Harvey McKay wrote a book a long time ago, right? It's about swimming with the sharks, but he had the Harvey McKay 66 questions, believe it or not, something like that. I'm not saying you got to go down that hole and get to all 66, but just imagine if you can just get to know three things personally and professionally, what's somebody's goals, dreams, aspirations, visions, what are the challenges they're working on this quarter? Where do they see their business six months from now, a year from now? You can unpack this in a conversation if you simply care. If you care enough to know, they will share. And then once you start opening up, it leads to the next thing about building trust. And that's meaningful value. And I just call this business insights or business smarts. And this is this is what I often refer to as two sides of the trust coin. You have to build authentic relationships and you have to bring meaningful value to the forefront. I don't care what type of seller you are. If all you're doing is bringing authentic relationships to the forefront and you're not bringing any meaningful value, you got a lot of friends, you got a lot of people who like you, but if you're not bringing any business smarts to the table, you're going to have a weak sales funnel and a weak pipeline. I've got to, you have to bring business smarts to the forefront. I've always shared this is you got to bring something to the table, whether that's the virtual table or the face-to-face business table. You got to bring something to the table that at the end of the conversation, that person goes, wow, that was one of the best conversations I ever had. I really learned something over the past insert, however amount of time that was. So here's what I want everyone to think about. Are you leaving people smarter afterwards than when you first entered the conversation? And if the answer is no, or I don't know, y'all got some work to do. Mm -hmm. But I always say, go ahead. I want to ask a fairly leading question here, because as I'm listening to this, I can imagine people on the other end of this episode going, okay, I need to learn. Uh, I got to go memorize a bunch of things about my product, about my industry to talk about. And so- uh, the, how I'm going to implement this is talking on the call. Is it just about telling the right things? Is it about asking the right questions? Is it about, you know, what is, what is that, you know, that meaningful value? What does that look like? So he, he, we're, we're, great question. And where I'm going with meaningful value, and, and here's what I'm going to encourage people to do. This is going to be polar opposite thinking of what a lot of people are probably thinking right now. I'm here to tell you this. It's not about your products and it's not about your services. Y'all have great products. Y'all have great services. Guess what? So does everybody else or they wouldn't be in business. My two cents on this. Where the conversations get deep is buyers, regardless of whatever title they are, they just want to know that you get them. You know them. You know something about their world. So you could say something in the very beginning of a conversation with somebody. Set your products and services aside for just a moment. And let's just say, I'll just use a chief financial officer as an example. Let's just say you're having a conversation with a chief financial officer and you can say something like this, Colin, I'll use your name as an example since you and I are on this podcast together. I can say something like, Colin, you know, I'm super grateful for our time together here this morning. I've really been looking forward to this conversation since we scheduled it a couple weeks ago. And as I get to thinking about our conversation, you know, over the past several weeks in engaging with conversations with other chief financial officers, these are the three things that we've been in deep conversations around over the last few weeks, point A, point B, point C. As we kick off our time together here this morning, Colin, I'm just curious, out of those three points, 
which one might hit the mark for you right now? Insert date and time that we're having this conversation. And you just got to be quiet. You literally got to be quiet. I promise you this. They will share one of those three things. Because the first thing that's going to go off in that person's head, oh my gosh, this person is speaking with other people just like me. These are some of the things I've been thinking about. And then you got to listen and listen and be curious. Whatever they share with you, then you layer upon that. Before you know it, you're scratching well below the surface. And then at the right time, you can pull in some product and some service-oriented conversation and layer it on top of those things you've been speaking about. You get what I'm saying? 100%. Yeah. I, I see the lens through... Um... We have like a market fit framework. It's it's big. It's like a big ugly spreadsheet that we designed to help go from like when learning what a customer does to like communicating the value. And everything yeah. starts with like the targeting hypothesis of like who you're going after, types of company, types of person. But then when you get into the need hypothesis, hypothesis, we look at what is the person's job description. What are they? What are their OKRs? What are their rocks for this year? Then what is the specific progress they're trying to make this quarter and then what's getting in the way and i think the thing that i think a lot of salespeople don't appreciate is that they are they're not going to be necessarily product experts they're not going to be cfo or financial experts but they are going to be experts in the problem space where they live they'll have way more conversations with way more cfos about this specific problem set and so you understand the size the shape the gotchas, the hidden corners, all of those things. And that's the kind of opportunity to be the air quotes expert and bring meaningful value, in my opinion. I'd love to your comments there, your thoughts. No, it, it's so true. If you ever want to see somebody's eyes light up, mm. talk about their issues, their roadblocks, help them cast some vision. You want to see their eyelids start closing and drooping and having them just slouch and all that. Start talking about your products and services. 100%. And I know you all are excited about your products and services. I sure hope so. But guess what? They're not as excited about your products and services as you are. What they're excited about is they're going to have a conversation with a sales professional who's going to wow them, who's going to educate them, who's going to bring them some insight who goes, man, this person gets my world. They're dealing with people just like me. They've helped people just like me unpack X, Y, Z. They can help me cast some vision. They can propel my business into the future. They can help me become a better person. Yeah. That's what they're looking for. And none of that exists in a PowerPoint. <laughs> zero. Zero. And 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 it's and it's so. I'm going to drop something because I just feel this is a great time to drop it is we have to enter into conversations as sellers with this philosophy. You got to have high intention and low attachment. You got to walk into these conversations with high intention, low attachment. I'll unpack that. You got to walk in with a servant's heart. You got to walk in with I'm there to help. Here at Selling from a Heart, we call it giving a rip. You got to give a rip, but you got to detach from the outcome. It's hard to detach from the outcome for most sellers mm -hmm. who have weak sales funnels and not a lot of prospects because you walk into every conversation with high intention, high attachment. And this leads to commission breath. And this is why in the last chapter of my book, I talk about not being an empty suit. Mm -hmm. high, walk into conversations with high intention. I'm here to serve. I'm here to help you. I care about you. But detach from the outcome. Watch what starts to happen next. Love it. I was just having this conversation with one of our reps. And uh, he was, I we've got a, a customer that said, yeah, we want to get started. Um, but for budgetary reasons, they got to start March 1st. And he's like, oh man, like he was mad. He's pissed off. And he, it wasn't, he wasn't mad and angry or anything like that. He was just disappointed. He's like, oh, sure. I was like, dude, you got to win. He's like, yeah, 100%. but not this month. I'm like, 
that's okay. I was like, the customers are going to buy on their own timeline. You have zero influence over their finance, over how their CFO sees the world, over their cash position. Yeah. Like all of these things are outside of your control. So focus on the things that are inside your control. Willingly accept that which is not inside your control. So I'm glad you just said control, which leads to the third foundation of this is you can control. That was a great setup call. And that was awesome. Thank you. So control, control what you can control. You can't control what you can't control. Here's what you can control. It's the third, third leg of the trust foundation or building trust. It's inspirational experiences. This is how y'all show up. This is what you guys can control or gals can control. I believe this firmly, 100% in my heart. Some people may disagree. That's okay. It's not your company's responsibility in how you show up. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility for the experience that you deliver. You control no, we, that. We're talking about the conversation. We're talking about my camera. We're talking about the clothes I wear, the attitude I show up with. What does that involve? All of that. You control all of this. The experience that you provide somebody, they're picking this apart. They are picking this apart. Some might say you're in an experience economy. Some may say you're in a relationship economy, so forth. Well, let's just talk about if you want to... And I learned this a long time ago. So I grew up in the office technology space in Southern California. I literally sold copiers for 30 years in Los Angeles. Okay. So I had, I was down the street. I was in oil fields. I was in some of the most unique places to sell copiers. I started just, my first, it, it, I'm sharing a story, but it just proves the point about inspirational experiences. So I, my first stint was selling copiers in the oil fields in Bakersfield, California. Central California. And then I rose up and, and I had my own copier dealerships with business partners and all this. But when I was a young seller, I learned something about inspirational experiences. It equated to people would pay more for experiences over no experiences. It's the same reason why people keep going back to insert favorite amusement park, insert favorite sporting event. People go back and pay more and more and more and higher prices and higher prices because the experience they get, that same philosophy can translate right into sales. That's why I believe sellers control this. Some might be going, Larry, I don't believe this. I think you're fully, you know what? That's okay. Yeah, your company has some control in this, obviously. What I'm asking sellers to do is step in front of your company, control the narrative, control the experience that you provide. You control all of this. Your reputation is at stake. Mm -hmm. Control all of this and it equates to profit. I, I learned this early on as a young seller that if I can build authentic relationships, if I can bring business smarts to the forefront. And if I can create an experience like none other, that had a direct correlation to profit. 100%. Yeah. I, you know, come, come back to the meaningful value, inspirational experience. Like I remember, you know, if I follow the, my progression in my career, you know, selling renting generators, where I eventually got to was the way I added value was asking good questions. I knew what to ask to effectively, appropriately size a generator and make sure that a customer wasn't going to make a mistake. Because mm -hmm. without getting into the geeky details, there are some things that you can do in like missizing things. And if you misquote a customer and then have to, you know, go up a size, you're you're hooped. And so the way I was able to help and actually deliver on a lot of this value was, you know, asking the right questions at the right time and making sure that I was kind of helping them make, not make a mistake, you know, and that, I mean, that's what got, that's what got me so much of this business is, is that they could, people knew they could call me and I was consistent. I was reliable. And even if they're sizing a Jenny for, you know, one of their own internal gen sets, you know, yeah. they didn't need one of my big ones. They could call me and I would still help them. 
you know, like I was the interface for my company. If there was an issue, I was out in the field. I wasn't, yeah. oh yeah, I'll send a mechanic. It was, I'll be out there. I'm going to grab Mo and get my truck right now and we'll be out there ASAP. And like, yeah. I was the user experience for my company and people bought because they love that. It's the reason why I pay a little bit more for stuff on amazon.com because yeah, I, I can get it right away. I know I'm probably not getting the absolute best price, but it's going to be there. It's consistent. If there's an issue, they get customer support and I've got a lot of trust with Amazon yeah. for certain things. People people will pay, call and people will pay for experience. It does all the time in your personal life and in your professional life. So here's a great exercise for all your listeners out there. Here's a great exercise. I, I double dog dare anybody to do this because what you hear is going to be pure gold. Sit down with your customer, right? Your favorite customer, the one that you call that will put a smile on your face when you're having a bad day. And you and you ask them this question as it relates to an experience. And it's quite simple as this. Again, I'll call and I'll use your name. Hey, call, you know, and you can just however you want to insert the very beginning of this. Small talk, small talk, small talk. Hey, I'm just curious, right? I, I, I think you can agree, Colin, that you know, customer experience plays a big factor in your decision to continue to do business with me and with any other company that you choose to do business with. So I'd just be curious, right? Hey, Colin, can I just get you to put your thinking cap on? Sellers, listeners, pay attention to this one. This is gold. And then just ask, when it comes to a customer experience, an outstanding customer experience, when's the last time somebody's wowed you? Like over the top, cherry on top, over the top sales experience. What did it look like? Describe it to me. What that person do that made it so special? I want to know. Hey, guess what, sellers? Be prepared. If they're not talking about you, there's some opportunity for you to create that wow factor by just listening to what your customers are saying, digesting it, taking some notes, and then going, man, how can I duplicate this, craft it, and bring it back out into the sales world? That's an inspirational experience. Inspire and influence your customers to keep coming back for more and more and more. Y'all control this. Just think about it. Love that. I think all of this is, these are easy, easy, easy things to do one time. It's very easy to go and, li and listen to this podcast and go, cool, I'm going to do, you know, meaningful value, authentic relationships. I'm going to do a little bit of this next week. It's very hard to build it into a habit. So talk to me about how, how I can not just how somebody who's listening can not just go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this once. How do we, how do I build this in? So this is something I'm doing every time. It, it, and it, and it go and it, the, thanks for a great segue again, Colin. It goes into it goes into discipline habits. And what, what's really interesting about this, I see it, and um, I'm pretty vocal about it. Is um, my two cents. My apologies up front, but there's a lot of salespeople out there that are chasing shiny objects. They love chasing the quick tip, the hack, the silver bullet. What's the next techie toy that's out there that's going to help me get from where I'm at to exceed quota? Let's just face it. It's out there. It's just reality. Guess what, folks? The key to your success is around three things that I firmly believe in, and it's woven into discipline habits, which is the last part of my building trust. And that is, are you radically consistent with doing the right things right? Are you disciplined? Are you doing it even when you feel like you don't want to do it? And do you have self-accountability? I do know this when it comes to disciplined habits. The mirror never lies. Only the person looking into the mirror lies. Think about that one for a second. And here's, a, can I share, can I share a story? Will you allow me Go to? For it. Um, I'm a big Napoleon. We've, we've talked about this. I'm a big Napoleon Hill junkie. I've been on a deep Napoleon Hill journey for two, three years now. 
ever since I was challenged to read the book Three Feet from Gold, once I read the book Three Feet from Gold by Sharon Lecter and Dr. Greg Reed, it took me down a path of finding every Napoleon Hill book that's ever been written and that's ever been released in the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I'm up to about 18 or 19, almost 20 books now that I've read over the last couple of years. And what was really interesting, and this plays into disciplined habits, and this is why this is so important. I read mental the book Mental Dynamite. I read this book about almost two years ago. And Mental Dynamite was a conversation between Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie that took place in 1909. So real quick math on that, everyone. That's 115 years ago. Mental Dynamite is the transcript that the Napoleon Hill Foundation found with that found between Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie. The reason why I bring this up is Napoleon Hill was a struggling magazine writer back in 1909, and he had an opportunity to interview Andrew Carnegie. Now, Andrew Carnegie at the time, Colin, was the wealthiest person in the whole world. There wasn't anyone richer than Andrew Carnegie because he had just told, sold Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan. Now we know him as J.P. Morgan Chase. And so, so listen, everyone, this is what he sold it for. Andrew Carnegie sold Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan for $480 million back in 1901. Do the math, do the do the conversion math on this now to $2024. That's a lot of commas and a lot of zeros. And the reason why I bring this up is early on in Mental Dynamite, Napoleon Hill asked Andrew Carnegie one question, which basically set up the whole book. And he said, Mr. Carnegie. And I'm paraphrasing, Colin. Mr. Carnegie, can you please share with me the key to your success? You're the wealthiest person out there. You've had amazing success. What's been the key to your success? This is what Andrew Carnegie said. He goes, the key to my success were two things, self-discipline and constructive habits. Self-discipline and constructive habits. Hmm. That's why I'm a big believer that what's forever old is forever new. They were talking about this 115 years ago. Fast forward to 2024, the key to seller success today is self-discipline and discipline habits, or as Andrew Carnegie said, constructive habits. The problem is that most sellers are consistently inconsistent. And that's why there's the roller coaster of revenue. Hundred percent. The a, re, a VP I worked with, VP of sales development I worked with, used to say, like sales is very simple, and the key to success is doing a bunch of little things consistently right over and over and over and over again. Like hundred percent, hundred percent. It, it's it, you just na- this you nailed it. It's just we just think about these little things, and everyone wants to bypass the little things. But I do know this, if you can't do the little things with discipline and consistency, you'll never be able to do the big things correctly and with any level of success. It's yeah. the found the little things are the foundational things. It goes back to professional athletes. Insert whatever professional sport you all follow. Find your favorite athlete in that sport. I promise you this, they're practicing the little things every single day day for sure hey sidebar on napoleon hill um or sorry um andrew carnegie for a minute have you um have you read the book titan no it's uh, it's it's in my amazon reading queue i um okay. it's long do i need to bump it colin it's i could not believe the level of the level of detail we knew about somebody who was who passed away nearly a hundred years ago. Like it's, it's incredible. I mean, obviously this was a pretty prominent figure. And so there was lots yeah. of research and I know newspapers and stuff existed, but the level of detail they could go into like his, I think it was his grandfather or his great grandfather was a literal snake oil salesman. Yeah. Back in the days of the wild, wild west. And that, yeah. that to me was like the, the level of detail they got to was really, really interesting. So yeah, I, I, I listened to it cause I found it a tough book to pick up and read. Yeah. But I was training for half iron at the time. And so okay. 
fire that into my ears and listen for four hours a time. I think it was like a 30 hour book or something like that. Wasn't sure. Holy smokes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Buffett's was 40 hours. It was like 41 hours or something. Uh, so yeah, yeah you know, and, <laughs> call me old fashioned. I've been called worse, but I can't listen to a book because no. when I listen, to it, I tried, but when I listen to a book, I find myself multitasking. Mm. When I read a book, I don't find myself multitasking. Give me a book. Give me a highlighter. I'm a happy camper. Yeah, I'm with you. I I have like two modes. I have like listening mode where I have like focus mode when I'm listening. I have distraction mode when I'm listening. And then I have intentional studying of a book. And <laughs> I, I ride, a, I, I'm a cyclist. And so I ride my okay. bike. And so I'll yeah. hop out on my bike. I'll go out for a couple hour ride and I'll listen to, you know, I you know, I was at a point where I was doing like two audiobooks a month because I was just ramping up. Sure, I get, I get it. And so I find it really easy because I'm I'm distracted with my body is doing another thing. And so I'm grinding away on the podcast or right. on, you know, on the bike. And it's I find it really easy to stay focused. But if yeah. I were to sit in my room and try and listen to a po- to an audiobook, there's no way. I have to be I have to be doing something physical. Otherwise, yeah. I'll like pick up my phone or get distracted. Yeah. But I use the audiobooks as a filter of should I study this book? And right. I've got a quarter of my bookshelf behind me, and it, the books have notes on them, you know. And this is like, oh, oh I love it! I love it! Yeah. You're that that's right up my alley, dude. 100%. So, yeah, it that's that's kind of my filter, anyway. Apologies for the distraction, um, and the kind of <laughs> sidebar. I've thrown as we're talking, I've been looking up the links and things we're talking about, and so I've got. Uh, a link to the Goodreads on the book Titan. I've got a a link to Anna, Andrew Carnegie's, um, uh, what is it? Fire uh, dynamite, mental dynamite, uh, mental dynamite. Cool. Uh, the title wasn't in the link. I was trying to read the link, um, and then I found the McKay sixty six questions. And so, it, it, just a heads up: if you click on that link, it is a link to a PDF. So, yeah, uh, just be aware. So I'm, I'm throwing s- some of these in. Um, I love how you're bringing all this together, the authentic relationships, the meaningful value, inspirational experience, and the disciplined habits. I'd love to hear how you've, you know, tell me about a team that you've worked with where you've kind of helped implement some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I do, um, here at Selling from the Heart, you know, we're, we do a lot of work in, and I've shared this with you previously, Call. we do a lot of work with full cycle sales teams and things like that, where they, where they own the whole journey from start to finish. So I do a lot of work in the food services space, tons of work in the food services space, hospitality industry, hospitality industry is the number one industry in the U S and so big success in working with food services is these, these are people that are selling to restaurants, not, not, I mean, it's not a glam job, right? You're selling food to restaurants, but we applied the four facets of the trust equation and how to build trust. First part of this is authentic relationships. Here's what I do know. And here's where they started to see opportunity is most sellers. And what I found in food services is they're not deeply connected to their customers. They might know one or two people to really at tops, but they're not high, wide, and deep. First thing is start surrounding and start building forts. And we started building forts around the rat, especially their top clients. And then I started to have them break down. Well, when you get in conversations with these people, what are the things y'all are talking about? And I listened and it wasn't business smarts or business insights. It was the same generic stuff everybody else shares. So the first thing we did with this, with this team was, We enhanced how many relationships. So we gave them tools to really unpack by title, right? Who are the six key decision makers and influencers? How well do we know these people? Now the next part of it is, what do you know about these people? Are you educating these people? Are you bringing insight to these people? And what was really interesting, the minute we started to coach them to go back to their customers and ask them simple things. What are three things you're working on here at this restaurant in the next 90 days? Where would you like to see your business a year from now? And just listening, 
this is what they started. They started to uncover opportunities that they didn't know before because they weren't asking these type of questions. And then we just had them just go, what are you doing that's different from everybody else? How are you showing up? Have you ever thought about how you're showing up to one of your customers? No one ever thought about it. So we just changed how they show up. And then they just became disciplined around it. And then pretty soon, you're not going to see overnight success. And I think that's what salespeople and sales leaders are looking for, is what got you to where you're at didn't happen overnight. It was a series of things you all have been doing for years. But if you can just, it, working with this team, just to see over 60 days, the changes, right? The changes in their confidence, the changes in their believability in themselves and their messaging. They start increasing their self-worth. To me, that's worth its weight in gold because if sellers can start doing that, They'll start prospecting with more consistency. They start asking the tough questions. And after about six months, then they started to see increase in sales, increase in profits. See where I'm going with this? Mm. But I think I think what's happening is sales leaders, they're looking for the silver bullet and the trick to help them over the hump like that. Well, guess what? It doesn't happen overnight, folks. You got to be willing to invest in your people, invest in your people, coach up your people and be consistent with it. Be disciplined with it. Small chunks of coaching. Well, watch what happens over time. But we're so, we're so short-sighted. Help me get to quota, right? I, I understand this. Y'all got to hit your numbers. Totally get it. I'm not here to say you don't have to hit your numbers. You got to hit your numbers. But when you become short-sighted with growth, it stunts your long-term sustainability. Okay. Short-term vision stunts long-term growth. And so in working with sales teams, we combine how you get through the short-term and combine it with medium and long-term growth. It's Again, it goes back to the last part of what we coach to, it's discipline habits. You got to be disciplined with this and do it every single day. If you do this every single day, you will see results and you will see results quick. And that's what this team saw. It doesn't matter whether you're in food services, whether you're in tech, whether you're in SaaS, doesn't matter. Apply those four facets and be consistent with it and play the long game. Watch what happens. Love it. Larry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. If people are looking to get in touch, they want to talk about, they want to find the book. They want to talk about, you know, what you do for customers. What's the best way for them to get in touch? Uh, you can find... You can find out, thanks for asking, Colin. You can find out anything you want to find out about what we're doing. Just go to sellingfromtheheart.net. Um, if any of this hit home with you and you want to learn more, if you want to grab the book, you can just go to sellingfromtheheart.net forward slash book. And then we we podcast every week and you can find the Selling From The Heart podcast on whatever favorite podcast platform you all listen to podcasts on, or you can find us on YouTube. Love and I'm all over LinkedIn. It's not hard to find. You can find Larry Levine on LinkedIn in two seconds. Love it. Larry, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing. I really enjoyed the experience. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Colin. Right on. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you all next week.